So the first thing I want to do today is just step back and say some things about what we've been talking about for the last two classes, Cartesian skepticism, Kantian skepticism. What are these labels for? What is their interest? What is their scope? How do they relate to each other? So um, I want to say some things about that. And that's what I'll do for the first half. And, and, and also address some objections that came up of the last few classes that I was deferring till today. And then uh, the second half of today, what I want to do is then start um, trying to give us a more operational way of identifying whether something's a form of Cartesian or Kantian skepticism by breaking it down into features, each of these into what I would call features of each of these genres of skepticism. And um, once one tries to do this, um, what you're doing is itself philosophically more complicated than it might appear at first. So I'll say some things about what we're doing in trying to do that. And then uh, towards the end of today, I want to begin to start talking about C.I. Lewis as an example of a certain kind of Kantian skeptic, who I think is very instructive. And then on Wednesday, we will continue that discussion. So uh, we're a little behind with respect to your syllabus, which might not be a bad thing. It means that you're on top of the reading. OK, so first topic I want to say about these kinds of skepticism is that uh, if you look across areas of philosophy, sometimes you'll notice that people are clearly concerned with a kind of Cartesian skepticism in philosophy perception. Other minds are very clear cases of this. In other areas of philosophy, at least today, in contemporary philosophy, you'll notice people are much more concerned with another of these forms. For instance, philosophy of language, especially the influence of Kripke's work and others. The focus is on what we were calling in last class Kantian skepticism about meaning. How is it so much as possible that a sign can mean something? How then could there be a fact of the matter, as Kripke puts it, about whether I'm adding or quadding? Um, so one thing you might conclude from this is, well, for some areas of philosophy, one kind of skepticism is the shape that skeptical problems take. For another kind of area of philosophy, the other kind of skepticism is the kind that problems take. I think uh, implicitly, lots of people seem to be drawn to some such conclusion in various things they say. So one reason I went to the trouble for the five areas we talked about to distinguish a variant of Kantian skepticism with respect to each and a variant of Kantian, Cartesian skepticism with respect to each and then a variant of Kantian skepticism with respect to each is that I want to say, no, that's not right. And I, I even want to make a philosophical claim now. This is a strong claim, really quite a strong claim. We could spend the whole class just discussing this claim. Um, there will be opportunities to discuss it as we go along. Here's the claim. I want to say, wherever one of these forms of skepticism is possible, the other is possible. It's a philosophical claim. It's not a sociological claim. It might be that if you look in the philosophy of law, so far, people are very, have mostly been very concerned about how do they know this precedent is correct? You could have a ruling which everyone takes to be correct and has been taken to be correct for a long time, and then it's suddenly overturned. And you can generate a Cartesian recital about how we know that legal rulings and relationship between legal decisions and precedents are correct. Is it really the right rule? And in this particular area, in this particular community, people who do philosophy of law aren't worried about Kantian skepticism about law. They aren't worried about the question which we might put like this. How is it that we could take a legal norm to be binding at all? How is it that we could so much as think that what someone did then has a legal bearing on what we must do now. How could this relation of accord between the previous ruling and the present ruling even so much as be incorrect? On the whole, for various reasons we could discuss. People in law school haven't faced that question much. But the point isn't what people who are writing about philosophy of law have said. The question is, if you've got one of these philosophical problems, does it in some sense require the possibility of the other being formulatable, and once formulatable, bringing its problems in its train. 
And I want to say in either direction, if you have one of these forms of skepticism, then the other is possible. So that's that's a claim about um, areas of philosophy where, where one rather than the other seems more pressing. That isn't to say that there aren't reasons why one isn't more pressing than the other. Sociological, historical, even philosophical reasons. But, um, but it's a claim about um, the shape of the problems. A second thing I want to say, and this is even more possibly crazy. I don't myself quite know whether what I'm about to say is true. I don't know how to test it, except to give many, many examples and to think about it. But what I want to say is anything that's recognizable as an area of philosophy is an area of thought in which these sorts of skeptical problems can arise. And even something like, in some sense, have arisen, because we can see the kinds of answers that are being given as implicitly involving a response to these kinds of worries, one or the other of these kinds of worries, however inchoately the worry itself is articulated. Um, so that's a claim about areas of philosophy. Um, so it, it follows from that that um, the five examples that we've been talking about from perception, philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, philosophy of action, philosophy of art are just examples. Uh, in principle, we could just spend the rest of the you know, next whatever is left, seven, eight meetings of this class just going through examples. I don't think that would be the best way to use the time, but we could do it. Um, I think there are a number of very interesting examples that are worth comparing to the ones um, that we have talked about. I thought I would just mention um, a few of these quickly, um, ones that I think aren't as obviously versions of the two we've talked about. Oh, thanks. The two we've talked about, but um, I think are also have exactly the same structure. Um, let me think about what order to do this in. One area is that's come up a few. I also mention these because I think when we were first discussing skepticism in the first class, when we were trying to just talk about straightforward skeptic Cartesian skepticism about the external world or about other minds, it started turning into other problems sometimes. So it's worth having some of these before one. One kind is uh, in the area of philosophy, which you might call philosophy of testimony, for lack of a better name for it or a um, more fancy name for this that brings out how it relates to other areas. We might call this second personal knowledge. Third personal knowledge is how can I know he is in pain? First personal knowledge has to do with things about what I can't help but believe, according to Descartes. For instance, I'm seeing something, but how do I know what I can't help but believe is really true, whether I really am in a class? Well, second personal knowledge is somebody tells me something. Naturally, before we do philosophy, we come to think of this as a way of acquiring knowledge, too. If I think of a lot of the things I know, you know, the northernmost university in the world is in Tromsø. Oslo is the capital of Norway. Almost everything I know about Norway, for starters. How do I know it? I've never been to Oslo. I've never been to Tromsø. It's not observational knowledge. I know it because someone told me or I read it somewhere. And in most cases, I take the capitals of the 50 American states. I don't remember who told me or where I read it. I might have been quite small when I first learned that Oslo was the capital of Norway. Um, the Americans usually have to get pretty old before they learn things like that. Um, but, uh, um, but at any rate, these are, I have a great deal of stuff in my head, which we normally think of as knowledge. But I have acquired it, if you will, by hearsay. Someone has told me that. Now, it's very easy to construct a Cartesian scenario that goes, well, the evidence could all be the same, but it's not true. You know, all of the evidence says that, you know, Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. But who's providing the evidence? Um, uh, probably some of you know the novel 1984 by George Orwell. That's, you know, a very powerful thought experiment about how uh, knowledge by testimony could be extremely faulty. It could be very coherent. You could read it. You could find out that right now we're at war with such and such, and we've won these battles and so forth. 
um, but the facts could be otherwise. So it's very easy to construct a Cartesian scenario. Here, the argument of illusion goes, all of your testimonial knowledge for X could be identical to what it is right now, but the fact itself could be otherwise. So now what's on the near side of the gap is what people tell us, the substance, the testimony. What's on the far side of the gap is that which the testimony is for. It's very easy to structure something that has a structure of a Cartesian argument from illusion. It's very easy to start saying, it's always possible that, and so on. Sometimes you need a bit of imagination to do it, but you can do it. Um, and you certainly um, can easily construct best cases where this has happened, especially if you think about things like the former Soviet Union or the Spanish Civil War. Unfortunately, with respect to this, you have real historical examples. You don't just need thought experiments. <laughs> uh, you actually have photographs, you know, where Trotsky has been airbrushed out of all the photographs. So it will, it will exactly fit into the Cartesian format we've looked at for the other problems. There's a best case. There's a ground for now. There's an argument for illusion. It generalizes precipitously for all knowledge of this class, and so on, all the way down the Cartesian format. Similarly, that can raise a problem, which is increasingly actually the issue in contemporary philosophy of testimony, which is a more Kantian problematic, which is, how could somebody's telling me something so much as be a form of knowledge? Isn't that always at best, you know, a form of probabilication, a form of better grounded opinion? So what happens is it starts looking like the paradigms of knowledge or something like perception and inference. And actually the tendency in philosophy of testimony is to explain how testimony is knowledge. If you get the right combination of people perceiving things and sound inferences, you can deduce it, mediated by testimony. And actually most of this debate, I think, actually winds up conceding skepticism. That is, testimony ceases to look like a possible kind of knowledge at all. And that's so, I think, um, increasingly, the tendency in philosophy of testimony is towards a Kantian problem, <coughs> where it looks like testimony can't even be a kind of knowledge. How could it be? Um, what's interesting about this case, which is why I mention it, is that unlike other areas of philosophy, the tendency is to actually concede the conclusion of the Kantian skeptic and say, maybe testimony isn't a kind of knowledge. It's just a mechanism. The only kinds of knowledge are first personal and third personal. There is no distinctively second personal. It's hard to get away with that. We're talking about perception or inference. It looks like we need these. You might think you can actually just give up on this one. But, um, but the actual problematics themselves are the same. Um, I spent too much time on that example. Let me do the other ones a little more quickly. Um, here's another whole area of philosophy. Issues about personal identity. But they really turn on issues of memory in this issue, in this literature. Derek Parfit is famous for making examples of these <coughs> kinds of cases. Say I clone Richard, and more importantly, his double has all of his memories. His memories are exactly the memory he's, he has right now. And then say Richard gets sadly sick. He's going to die. So we put him out of his misery. We shoot Richard. We bring his double in. We need Richard. We can't live without Richard. What the class would be in terrible trouble about teaching us. So we bring the double in. We have the new Richard Suey. But actually, this is the new Richard Suey. That all happened this morning. And say we ask Richard, are you the double? Or are you the original Richard? Well, Richard doesn't. His memories are what his memories would be. It's all the same. Well, so Parfit says, what it is to be Richard, this is a version of Barclayanism, I might, you might say, with respect to personal identity. So, his, so skepticism is, how do I know that I am really me, or I'm just something or somebody who has the same memories? That's the skeptical word. Parfit's answer 
to that skeptic. He never, he never motivates as a separate form of skepticism, but I think you can see once you put it that way, it's a form of Cartesian skepticism, just like the other ones. And then, Parfit quickly jumps to Barclay and Hansen, you know, the SES Percipi version of the answer and philosophy of perception. It says, what it is to be rich just is to have those memories. Um, but the point is, you have a structure of the argument from illusion there. Um, if you can't tell the difference from within, on a certain understanding of within, then what could the difference consist of? And you have a certain skeptical recital. And there's a corresponding Kantian problematic which Hume first started to make urgent by asking, what is it so much as to be a self? How could we be anything other than just a mere collection? What is the unity of the self? Such a, It could start looking like the answer is not the Cartesian answer, where you, where you know the difference between, it's clear to you that you seem to be a unified self, but how do I know I'm really the one I think I am? That's an issue about identity, existence, really. But, but what's taken for granted on the Cartesian side as always, is question the Kantian side. And the question is, how could there so much as seem to be something which is a self that's unified with respect to anything? Say, um, what are the conditions of the possibility of that? Um, and Kant himself you know, made that an urgent question, the paralogisms. Um, so that's a form of Kantian skepticism you actually do find in Kant. Um, but again, there's a Cartesian version and a Kantian version. Sorry I did that so quickly, but there's many things to discuss. Um, Maybe just two other examples, because I think, again, it's useful to see how very different issues all have the same form. It's the philosophical issue which we might call, this isn't discussed as much in philosophy, it's not a fashionable topic. I think it's very useful, though, to see how it has the same form, because it helps one see how these gaps, these Cartesian and Kantian gaps, are, they can come up in very different sorts of ways. Um, so a problem about the reality of the past, it's a little bit like testimony, only there's no testimony in this example. Um, it can be my own first personal evidence. The issue about the reality of the past is, how do I know that something really happened in the past? How can we have knowledge of the past? Um, the point could be about testimony. We can know everything we do about Hannibal, but he never crossed the Alps. <laughs> it's just a myth. Turns out it's like the Iliad. Maybe if you think the Iliad's true, it's like Atlantis, whichever one that people thought was true that's not now. Or it could be an issue about your own memories. But the question is, it starts looking like, in this way, it's like the testimony case. I'm never actually presented with the past. My knowledge of the past is always in the present. And now you can generate a Cartesian format. Everything with respect to the present could have exactly the disposition it does now, but how things actually were in the past could be different than they are now. So it looks like the past fact can blankly obtain in a way that is um, given what is available to me, the present, always transcendent with respect to that. And so you can always generate a Cartesian problematic. Isn't it possible that you don't? And then it can start looking like knowledge of the past, can never really be knowledge. Again, it can at best be well-grounded opinion or probability or highly probable. And again, you can generate a Kantian problematic here. People haven't generally, but there's nothing, once you've set it up this way, to keep yourself from worrying about how can we so much as make sense of knowledge of the past? Um, is it, is it, it can start looking like, given the premises that Cartesian is using, that knowledge, as Bertrand Russell put it once, can only be of what is immediately present to one. And the very idea of knowledge of the past is a contradiction in terms. You can have, you can have guesses about the past, you can have highly, maybe even you might think highly well-grounded guesses, but you can actually have knowledge of it. One last case, because um, I picked this one that I think it's much less intuitive, it's, it, and historically it doesn't have the same pedigree. These are all rather old philosophical problems, actually, that have become, the form of skepticism with respect to them has become more and more articulated in certain ways, but um, you can go back to the ancients and find philosophical worries of all these three sorts. This is um, something much more 
specific that comes out of post Phrygian philosophy. But uh, I think it's uh, it's worth mentioning because um, it'll come up in some of our readings. And so it's worth seeing that it has exactly the same form again. It has to do with issues about philosophy of reference. Let's, you know, there's many ways you can generate this, but let's generate this with respect to issues of singular demonstrative thought. So I say something like, you know, that person, blah, 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 blah. Or, uh, the liquid in his glass is champagne, to take a famous example from the literature, or whatever. Um, and it can turn out I was wrong. <coughs> that is, what I thought I was referring to is not what I was referring to. But things could have been exactly as they seem to me to be. And I could have either been referring correctly or referring incorrectly. So the basis on which my act of reference was made, this is where the Chartesian scenario is generated, looks like does not suffice to secure successful reference. It does not suffice to guarantee the avoidance of a failure of reference. Um, this is often done in the contemporary literature as a distinction between sense and reference. So sense is understood and I want to say this now quite clearly, just to make it clear, I'm not giving you my views about anything, including my views about Frege. I'm giving you something that's in the philosophical literature. Sense here is understood as a mode or a way of presentation, where this is understood in Cartesian terms. So the sense, the way of presentation is how things are to me, how things present themselves to me. So sense looks like it's on my side of the gap. I don't think so. And this often goes with some analytic philosophers saying, sense is a psychological <coughs> matter, ultimately. The sense of a term differs for different people, depending upon psychological facts about in which they perceive things. It's a complete mystery in Frege, I might add. There's a kind of Kantian, we could say. But um, leave that aside. Um, so here, sense is understood. is how things are to me. The reference is how things are in the world, what I'm actually picking out. And then it looks like the sense could be exactly as it is, but the reference different. That generates a Cartesian problem of identification. In some of the earlier literature on direct reference and so forth, you have people worrying about this Cartesian problematic. The real problem that becomes urgent very quickly in this literature, and is more at the center of it in contemporary knowledge philosophy, is a Kantian problematic. That is, it's the question of, if you understand sense this way, how could sense ever so much as secure reference? Why is it, you know, the actual reference of our terms, something that always goes beyond our basis for grasping things, which looks like it's always just in the realm of sense. And this raises questions then about huge literature, about how to understand the relationship between sense and reference. Um, I mention that because it will come back. But these are just some very quick examples. Why <coughs> I'm doing these so quickly? I tried to spend a whole class doing five examples carefully. But this is just a way of indicating over and over again in philosophy you can get problems with the shit. The ones I picked, I just picked because we need some clear examples. But not because I'm saying this is where it happens. Um, philosophy of law actually was another example I mentioned briefly, which could be, could be elaborated. Um, so there's many cases of this. Now, um, here's another claim. Uh, this is a sociological claim now, not really a philosophical claim, but I think it's also true, which is, if you look at the shape of philosophy in the late 20th and the early 20th century, what you have happening increasingly is a shift from a focus on Cartesian skepticism to a focus on Kantian skepticism. Uh, once you notice that's true, it would take some work to show that's true, but once you notice that's true, if you think it is, that raises a, a, an interesting question, which is, why should that be so? Why is that happening? So I think, actually, if you look at the literature and philosophy of law, you'll start to notice they're getting interested in Kantian skepticism. 
Certainly, philosophy of language and philosophy of mind are squarely worried about Kantian skepticism. In areas like epistemology, increasingly, the pressure is not judged. It's certainly happened in this literature that there's been a development that way. So there's an increasing pressure to move that way. Aesthetics, in the cases we were discussing, those another fine example of how that tendency has taken place in the last few days. Um, I'm not saying that when it happens in a particular area of philosophy, they're particularly noticing what's happening in other areas of philosophy and copying. It might partly be that. But part of it is a dialectic <coughs> that's internal to these areas themselves. So you know that leads to a kind of prediction that we can make. In an area of philosophy where people are only preoccupied with the Cartesian problematic, wait a while. I predict everyone in this room is young enough. I predict that within your lifetime, you will see a change in the literature because it, the tendency that the slope is now very sharp. The, the, the ice is collapsing. Um, uh, the sort of warding off of this problematic in areas of philosophy. So that's an interesting sociological claim. So these, so I've just made some large claims which we can explore later in the class, but I mention them now to let you go out. I'm sure different ones of you have worked in different areas of philosophy more than others. Try it out. See, look at the literature, look at its history, look at the problems, look at their shape, see what you find. Yes? Well, can you just give a very short answer to the social claim? Why is it like that? No, I think you're true. Well, I, I, will, yeah. I will give an answer to that, okay, but not right now. Okay. We, we will do it through the authors we'll read. If we read Cavell and McDowell and Putnam, they have, <coughs> as it were, views about this. And by thinking about their views, we'll also come to a view in the class. Mm -hmm. I'd rather do it that way. Um, McDowell is someone we'll see has a lot to say about this in his own terms. Um, so I'm, I certainly need to be raising questions that we will come back to. But right now, I just want people to have them on their mind. Um, here's another kind of thing to look out for. This is on my list of just offering you things to look out for. Something I think you find in philosophy is people who, with respect, right now I've been going, talking, contrasting these two variants, varieties of skepticism, Cartesian and Kantian. But I think another interesting phenomenon is people who, across different areas of philosophy, have very different tendencies or philosophical inclinations with respect to a philosophical problematic that has exactly the same form. So let me give you an example. This is something I found particularly in Europe, so I'll mention it here. There are examples of this kind of inconsistency in English-speaking philosophy, but I think they happen in different places. But I've noticed, especially in Europe, especially in Germany, but also some extent in French, France also, France and Germany, um, Nobody anymore wants to be a Cartesian about perception. I don't know who gets the credit for this, if it's Heidegger or Merleau-Ponty or who exactly, but you just have to start a Cartesian problematic philosophy of perception. If you have a well-educated, you know, famous professor of philosophy at Frankfurt or Berlin or the Sorbonne, they immediately will dig in their heels. So you just start out and try to say, well, um, Right now, I might be in a classroom. I think I'm in a classroom, but I might be dreaming. So things could be exactly as they appear. And they will immediately start to dig in their heels and say, you are making a Cartesian assumption. You are assuming that there's a self-standing perceptual realm that's independent of the external world. But this assumption is disastrous. As soon as you make that assumption, you will fall into it. So there's a great deal of resistance to even trying to begin a Cartesian perception, <coughs> at least among some people. But what I also notice is these very same people, you change the subject to philosophy of language, and you say, okay, there is a sign. Now, in order to understand the sign, I have to interpret it. But there's always the possibility of misinterpretation. Things could be just as they are. My interpretation could be very sedimented. Yet I have misunderstood the sign. So what the sign means is always something that in principle could be beyond the horizon of interpretation. And what I tried to show you two classes ago, we were discussing Cartesian skepticism, we went through this in more detail, was 
that problematic in philosophy language has exactly the same structure as the problematic in philosophy perception. You have exactly the same form of argument from illusion. You have the same gap. It's going to generalize in the same way. Um, in the one case, you're going to concede a problematic of a certain shape to, shape to the skeptic. And if you think in perception, no, no, I'm not taking a view right now. I'm being completely neutral. I'm not saying we should say what that German professor says about perception. Maybe he's wrong. Maybe we can concede the Cartesian that and then argue with him. And I'm not taking issue with what he says about um, interpretation. Maybe we're right, you know, to concede that. All I'm saying is that the problematics have the same shape. But the tendency is not to notice that they have exactly the same shape. So in the one case, one says, anything that has that shape will give the Cartesian skeptic exactly what he desires, and he cannot do that. And then to take something that has that shape, to get into a form of response that looks very much like the traditional response, the Cartesian skeptic about perception, where you say, well, yes, we might always be wrong, but and still try to answer the skeptic having seeded something of that shape, which is exactly, for instance, what Heidegger Momo from T thinks you better not do in the realm of perception. So the point here is just the possibility of a kind of inconsistency, but it's a very subtle kind of inconsistency. There isn't a straightforward logical. It's not easy to show that someone has committed themselves to P and not P. There's not inconsistency in a straightforward thing. You have to first actually see whether you think these problematics have the same shape, something I'm claiming, especially with respect to these very quickly. But with respect to any of these two you know, philosophical areas we discussed, if you do come to see that the problems have the same shape, you think that's right, then that does kind of create an issue about what philosophical consistency would look like across areas of philosophy. And I, my, my, one of the things I think is so interesting is the extent to which people don't recognize a problematic that comes back in the same form as soon as it's dressed in a new clothing. So you have exactly the same professor um, thinking, no, we need a view about perception where somehow we can say that in the act of perception itself, there is a way of being honest to how things are that doesn't take place across a Cartesian gap. But then with respect to interpretation, they think, oh, there must be a gap always between the interpretation and the sign, the meaning of the sign, with exactly the same problem. OK, um, so that's just an issue that will come up later in the class. And one of the things we'll see with respect to our different philosophers, three of the people we're going to read, Cavell, Putnam, and McDowell, it's that they are resolutely Kantian about some issues, but resolutely Cartesian in their construal of others. And that creates interesting complications. And they're trying to think through their view, and they're trying to talk to each other. <laughs> um, um, conveniently, each has written about the other. Um, so that's a kind of way of saying something about where we're going. Um, some other quick issues that came up I wanted to address. I'm going to do this quite quickly, too. One has to do with um, these labels, Cartesian and Kantian. I don't want to spend too much time on this um, right now, just not because it's not interesting, but because it could take a lot of time. But there's various distractions I risk introducing with these labels, and perhaps I shouldn't use them. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I should just call them skepticism one, skepticism two, but I don't want to do that, actually, because I think they're earlier forms of skepticism. But then if you start talking about skepticism three, immediately makes people want to ask, well, what about one and two? <laughs> so why use these labels? Um, let me first say uh, various things about how to understand the labels that I don't intend to commit myself to. I'm not saying the earliest you can find a form of Cartesian skepticism at all is in Descartes. I don't think that's true. And I'm not saying the earliest glimmer of a form of Cartesian Kantian skepticism of Kant. I don't think that's true. So they're not marking the philosophical birth and the first planting of the philosophical seed of either of these problematics. Um, I'm also not saying that you can only find, if you look at Descartes, the only form of skepticism you can find in Descartes is Cartesian skepticism. Um, in response to a question by Dixon, before I tried to say quickly why I don't think that's right. I think if you look at 
Descartes worries about the evil demon or about the eternal creation of eternal truths. You have a sapient form of Kantian skepticism that Descartes worried about. I actually have written an article about this many years ago. So I can give it to you if you don't believe I think that. I can prove I think that. <laughs> um, it's part of how I got an interest in this issue. Um, and I'm not saying the opposite either. I'm not saying in Kant that the only form of skepticism Kant's worried about is Kantian skepticism. On the contrary, he's definitely concerned to respond to Descartes. I think, for instance, the refutation of idealism, the second edition of the critique of pure reason, is his making it explicit how the argument of that book applies to what he calls the problematic idealist. That's his word for what I call Cartesian skepticism. Um, but I am claiming that that's not the only thing that Kant is interested in. And it's not primarily or focally what he means by skepticism. Um, just like when Descartes uses the word skeptic, he's concerned with the thing I'm calling <coughs> Cartesian skepticism. So what I do think, this is why I use these labels, and what these labels mean will only become clear in the second half of today's class. What I think is it's with Descartes that a variant of Cartesian skepticism first becomes fully visible, that it achieves what we might call full flower, or a way of putting this somewhat more substantively is it clearly has all nine of the features that are on the first page of this handout. It's at that point that the full shape of Cartesian skepticism is, is very lucidly spelled out with respect to one variant. And similarly, with respect to Kantian skepticism, there's clearly anticipations of this elsewhere, especially in Hume, of course, no accident that he awoke Kant from his dogmatic slumbers. But it's first in its systematic form and having all of these features and on the second page of this handout with Kant, that we have a variant of the Kantian variety. And I say a variant because then I think, as, we, as I've been trying to argue, once you start seeing what it is to have this form of skepticism, you can start seeing that it can come from many areas of philosophy. And I'm not saying about either Descartes or Kant that they raised it with respect to these areas. With respect to personal identity, with respect to issues about causation, skepticism of causation, which we didn't talk about, with respect to perception, there are a few cases where Kant clearly started to formulate a full-blown Kantian problematic. Um, and in Descartes' case, even fewer, really mostly only perception. But I'm claiming that, the, that we have at least a variant that fully lucidly conceived so that it, it has this full shape and these figures. That's the reason they get the label. So the label's working in an extremely specific way. Michelle, you had a yeah, well, question. It's really an extremely specific way. Uh, I've thought about that. Uh, I think it's very problematic um, to use those terms anyhow because in your paper, the, let's say, the uh, structure of augmentation is very betrayal because you're using those terms kind of 50 or 60 times just to make a claim that they are true and I, I keep on not believing that they are really valid, especially about the, 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 the term cancer skepticism. Really, um, well, 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 I'm not sure what you're saying. Here's a question which we have to get into Kant interpretation to talk about. But um, when Kant uses the word skeptic, is he raising a question about what I call Kantian skepticism? Mm -hmm. About that, I want to say yes. Generally, yes. Or the other things are for Kant ultimately to be understood as philosophical problems you can only well address by addressing the skeptic. Yeah. I do want to say yes to that. Um, but, um, but you know, to have a full discussion about that would blow a, a large hole in the class. Um, but um, if you want to look at one thing, I suggest look at section 27, the, uh, the um, coda, I would call it, the deduction of the B edition of the transdental deductions. The, concluding session. There he says, he gives the example of cause and effect, but I think it could be any of the categories. That's just an example. I think there even is a some Beispiel there when he introduces it. And he says, if you take the form of necessity involved here to be a form of necessity in which one sign, one cannot help but think we are so made either by custom or by God, so that we cannot help but 
conjoin the effect of the cause. Then you give the skeptic what he most desires. This is the one place he actually uses the word skeptic in the whole transcendental deduction. Yeah. And yeah. he says, if you did that, you would reduce. Oh, you would, you would, you would be left with a position where we have at most an illusion of objective validity. And then the question is, what is an illusion of objective validity? And if you follow that out, you're going to be led back to passages like the one I quoted at the beginning, where he says, if we lack the categories, there would be no unity. There would be no objective validity. There would be no presentations that give things true or false. We would have less than a dream. But that, that's my claim. Um, he is kind of answering Hume's uh, skepticism by, by, by um, let's say, um, defining the categories because Hume is worried about uh, causality and Kant is just um, but that's way too that causality is existing because a priori, that's it. So that's not skeptic at all. That's an answer to skepticism that's trying to overcome it by what he calls criticism. Well, you're confusing extreme, various things here. Um, first of all, I'm not saying Kant is a skeptic. You know what I'm saying? Descartes is skeptic. Both the terms Cartesian skepticism and Kantian skepticism are labels for the problem that each of these philosophers are addressing. But Kant certainly thinks Hume is a skeptic. Even Hume thinks Hume is a skeptic. Um, yeah. So, uh, one of the few. Um, so, people who think that about themselves in the history of philosophy. And then the question is what kind of problem is that? I do think Kant thinks that he is clearer about what Hume's problem is than Hume was. He, Hume thinks he can, as it were, localize his problem to certain, what Kant would say, to only some of the categories. Causation was one of the things that Kant wants to show, is that when Hume says, we have an impression of a red triangle, that of already imports objective validity into our characterization. That is not a, a bare infindel. That is a forstellum. And if we can't analyze the character of that forestone, we see we'll have both intuitive and a conceptual aspect. So that if we really think through Hume's skepticism all of the way, we won't just have experience that lacks causal unity, but will possess these other forms of unity Hume wants it to have, and then bootstrap itself up. If you really think through Hume's skepticism all the way, what you have is a problem about how experience, the deliverances of experience, could so much as give us any form of unity, the kind of skepticism I was talking about when I talked about Kantian skepticism about perception last class. And the task in Kant is to try to explicate how it is with the conditions of the possibility of our experience having that kind of unity, even as I put it, the unity of a false judgment. Yeah. So an illusion of objective validity is an illusion that we could so much as even have experiences that are of a shape that could present themselves as being true or false. That's what objective validity means there. Um, so I think it, it doesn't fit. He does give a very clear gloss on Cartesian skepticism. That's about given that we have representations of inner sense that have this unity. How can we know that there could be a genuine faculty of outer sense that presents things as they are in the world and not just as they are in us. That's the Cartesian problematic, where how, things can seem a certain way, but how can we know that things outside are as things seem inside? It's a completely different characterization of that than he does when he's responding to this generalized problem of human skepticism. I think they're clearly distinct in Kant. Kant thinks you have to address this form of skepticism the generalized human skepticism, which leads to, for Kant, Kantian skepticism in various areas, including perception. I'm claiming even more areas than Kant realized, but he has the basic idea. Yeah. Um, and that it's only through a discussion of that that you can then have the resources for addressing the Cartesian skeptic. And, you know, I'll say this even very quickly. The response to the Cartesian skeptic is, you couldn't even have what you think you have namely perceptions that seem to be of something, unless you already had more. Yeah. So you either have to have less 
or more. But you can't set up the problem the way you want to set it up. That's the, Kant that's the strategy of the Kantian response to Cartesian skepticism, which requires that you address this kind of skeptic first. Yeah, okay. So th that, that's very fast. Um, I, you don't have to be convinced by it. Okay, I, I'm not, but uh, I really understand <laughs> what, you, what you told me, absolutely, but I just wouldn't call it Kantian skepticism. I wouldn't call it well, pragmatic, really. Well, what it's reason, me, maybe I'm stupid, you know, but it, 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 it provokes confusion, you know? Well, it's, if you want to know what Kant means by the word skeptic, you want to look at I things that have the shape of handout two, not handout one. That seems to me a reasonable reason for calling that. That's my answer. <laughs> um, okay, so now, quickly, a couple of other items of business, and then we're going to stop and have a break. Um, there was another question Miko asked, asked last class, which I wanted to answer briefly, start to answer briefly, or at least maybe what I should do since we've spent a lot of time is at least get the question out clearly, um, which is, here's a different kind of worry about calling these Cartesian skepticism and Kantian skepticism. Michel right now has been complaining about calling this Kantian skepticism. But here's another worry you could have, which he also had at one point, which is, okay, it's Kantian, but should we call it skepticism? Okay, but that's another worry that one could have. Um, I think a good worry. Um, here's why one might have that worry. You might think, especially if you focus on Cartesian skepticism as your model, you might think, well, what skepticism is is a problematic which has to do with knowledge. Skeptics are people that doubt we have a certain kind of knowledge. Knowledge about the past, knowledge about the external world, knowledge about other minds. And skepticism issues in a doubt about the possibility of that knowledge. And then if that doubt cannot be overturned, then the skeptic wins. The skeptical doubt um, turns out not to be answerable. If it can be, then we have an answer to skeptics. So it's very natural to think of skepticism as having that shape. Um, if you're introduced to it in the Cartesian format, you might think that's a necessary feature of skepticism. If you think those are necessary features of skepticism, then you're right to conclude that what I'm calling Kantian skepticism, if you really get clear about what it is, you'd be right to conclude that's not a kind of skepticism. Because if you think clearly about Kantian skepticism, it no longer is directed peculiarly at knowledge. That is, it's just as much a problem how you could have false experiences as true experiences. Um, it's not a question about how do we know which experiences are true. And indeed, if you start thinking it through, it's just as much a problem about how we could have a determinate, contentful attitude of doubting as it is how could we have one about knowing, or for that matter, one of dreaming. How can we so much as dream anything? It's just as much a question in philosophy of perception as how can we know that we truthfully perceive something. So, once you start noticing this aspect of the problematic, it can start seeing like this isn't skepticism anymore. It's ceasing to lose the character of skepticism because the problem is so basic. It's not allowing us to draw the Cartesian line between the dubitable and that which is invulnerable to them. those attitudes like dreaming, having things seem a certain way, doubting, which can take place on this side of the Cartesian gap. And they have a kind of self-transparency for the performer and things like how things really are in the world how things are inside Richard's mind, how things are in the past, the things that are in the far side of immediate Cartesian acquaintance. That gap itself, both sides of it become problematized, the near side as well. Um, so I think this is a reason, it's a reason someone could say, this is no longer a form of skepticism. And um, I just want to make it clear. If you want to say, this is not a form of skepticism, each of the Kantian variants, because they don't have those features of the Cartesian variants. Then I'm not saying, yes, you must call it skepticism. <laughs> um, that seems to me a pointless argument. That's, that would just be a kind of linguistic stipulation at that point. So, all I want to say about that is, call it what you want, 
as long as you don't confuse yourself. But there are reasons for calling this skepticism. Um, one reason I am going to claim is if you want to know what Kant means by the term skeptic, or you want to know what Kripke means by the term skeptic, or you want to know what Wittgenstein means by the word skeptic, then if your model is Cartesian skepticism, you will misunderstand them. We will see that in respect to those cases later in this class. So I'm, I'm not trying to legislate how the word is used. I'm just pointing out the word gets used across these varieties, and we want to be able to keep clear. We don't want to just assume that because it's the same word, it must have a Cartesian shape. That's one thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is, if there turns out to be a systematic relation between these two varieties of skepticism, that would be a further reason why this wouldn't be an arbitrary word to use. <laughs> if these things have nothing to do with each other, and it's just sort of an enormous category mistake to conflate this problematic with that problematic, then it is a little easier to take up the position. Um, don't call that skepticism. So that's a question, we, I think, a philosophical question we need to investigate in the course, which is, what is the relationship between these two varieties? And one of the things we're going to look at is various philosophers who have, I think, implicitly taken views on that question. And as I was suggesting very briefly to Neil, I think Kant had views on that question. And so, depending upon what your view is on that question, I think bears on this question how appropriate the terminology is. It's not, there are underlying philosophical issues. I don't want to prejudge them. That's why I'm flagging this issue. But I want to point out that they're not, they can't be decidable in a minute. Let's take a break and then come back and start working the handout. So let's see you in 10 minutes. Is that right? So what I'm going to do now is um, try to go through some, in a little more detail, <coughs> features of Cartesian Kantian skepticism. And what I want to do is give us something such that we can then look at the authors we read for the course. There'll be some authors we look at briefly, some we'll look at in more detail. And we can actually just ask ourselves, does this have a Cartesian shape or a Kantian shape? And it's useful to have a way of trying to address that quickly. As we look more closely at some of these authors, the answers will be more complicated. I'm not trying to simplify the issue, but at least have some way of getting an initial take on an author. I want to do this by giving you a set of features for each. It also, I think, avoids having, um, once you have a whole set of features that are conceptually interrelated, then I think you get a much better lock on what the problematic is. If you just try to do it with a word, does the word possibility occur? Well, doubting the possibility of something versus doubting the reality of something is a pretty good way of putting a difference between Cartesian um, and Kantian skepticism. But if you make it about the word possibility, that's not going to work. I mean, Cartesians will say, it's always possible that you might be wrong. You say, oh, there's the word possibility. And the Cartesians say, so it's not Cartesian, it's Kant. And if you just try to make it about a piece of terminology, it's not going to work. It's got to be something that has a philosophical shape. Um, and so to make sure you have a philosophical shape, I think you need a bunch of features that interlock a certain way. The worry about possibility has to lead a certain place, has to have a certain bearing on issues about particularity and generality and reality. Um, so that's part of the point of the features, is to make sure we've, we're really mapping a shape of a problem and not going on you know, the occurrence of a word that can, can be put to a very different kind of use. Um, and indeed, one of the things I'm going to want to claim, and I'll even give you an example of this next class, is that um, there's a lot of very basic philosophical vocabulary in the case of, say, epistemology or perception, there are words like object, consciousness, phenomenon, um, epistemic, uh, the given. Let's just take those. I can make this a very long list. <laughs> but there's something one might call philosophical terminology. These are words you encounter when you read H. H. Price, or Husserl, or Heidegger, or McDowell, very different philosophers. You'll find words like this, say when they're talking about perception, and a whole bunch of others. We can make this list longer, we will. And um, I'm going to claim that this whole vocabulary functions a different way, depending upon whether we're in a Cartesian or a Kantian register. So you can have philosophers 
that are literally uttering the same sentences with the same words in it. But their philosophical problem is different. And so it makes it very easy for philosophers to misunderstand each other, talk by each other, think they're disagreeing with each other, we're not talking about the same thing, think they're agreeing when they don't. We'll have examples of both those things. <laughs> I'll give you concrete examples of those things later. But um, So this is a further reason why we don't want to make this about terminology. On the contrary, we want to get a certain feeling for what the dialectical structure of philosophical issue is such that that itself determines what the terminology is doing. So when we go through these features, what's at issue here is how the features are interrelated. It's not an issue of, here's a bunch of words, go look for words. Um, okay, so um, nine Cartesian features. Cartesian skepticism, if it's Cartesian, <coughs> the problematic is always going to start with something like a best case, or an ideal case. And so here's a very simple fact about Cartesian philosophy, which already distinguishes it from Kantian philosophy. It's very interesting examples. It's full of examples. You know, if you read Descartes, it starts with these examples. If you read the Critique of Pure Reason, it's hard to find examples. Hilary Putnam once said, there's one example in the book, drawing a line in thought. But he uses it 300 times to make 300 different points. <laughs> it's slight exaggeration, but it's not far from wrong. And so those are maybe extreme cases, but there's a point here that generalizes across other philosophers. Cartesian philosophy, I'm not saying this is a criticism of Kantian philosophy. I'm saying it's a point about the shape of the issue. Cartesian philosophy originally depends upon a certain kind of traffic, an example. And the Kantian problematic, if you understand what it's doing, makes examples themselves not able to bear that kind of weight. Um, so, further, not just examples, but the example has to be well chosen. It has to be a best case for the philosophical problematic. Now, what best case means can, can vary. Um, if we just take the perception case, the epistemology, we can develop this in some detail. So, best case means, first of all, the kind of thing with respect to which there are no experts. If I say, that's a Japanese beetle or an M16 rifle, and I turn out to be wrong, we're not going to get skepticism. So it's always things like chairs, tomatoes, tables, hands. Have to be the kind of thing that we all can tell one when we see one. That's a feature of it. Um, so that's one aspect of it. Another, so um, so one of the things this means is that, um, to borrow a phrase from Stanley Cavell, Cavell says in your Cavell reading, you'll see him saying this. I think it's a helpful point here. What you need the Cartesian worry to be about is what he calls a generic object. But the point here is not, there are two kinds of objects in the world. There are generic objects, and there are specific objects. This isn't an ontological distinction, so that um, we can divide the world. And we got to pick tomatoes rather than M16 rifles, because a tomato is a generic object, and an M16 rifle is a specific object. A tomato can be a Sonoma, California tomato. A chair can be, you know, um, an Oliver Alto 1936 chair. Um, any object can be described such that my knowledge of it is of something that is a specific object. And so construed, you're not going to be able to get Cartesian skepticism out of that kind of claim for knowledge. So what makes it a generic object is, is going to have something to do with the manner under which it's brought up and the manner under which it's scrutinized. It's not just a question about a kind of a thing, but a kind of a question that's being directed at the thing. It's a stand-in for something I can see. How can I know things are as they, I see them? And so the object is going to be characterized in extremely generic terms. 
So that all we want to know is that that which all I need my senses for in order to know, that minimal way in which I, it's clear to me I'm engaged with an object there. How can I know that I am engaged with an object the way I think? So part of what best case here means is there's got to be an example. It's got to be an example there are no experts with respect to. But it's also an example of an object which clearly isn't a specific object, but that object has to be taken up in a certain kind of way. So the pressure is on, as it were, the kind of cognitive faculty that's being investigated. Knowledge by testimony, knowledge by the senses, whatever the issue. Um, this also means, of course, there ha can't be any, part of what best case means here is there can't be any questions about the conditions under which we encounter it. So, you know, the lights have to be fine. The distance has to be fine, and so forth. You know, um, um, so there's a kind of way in which the Cartesian epistemologist is a little bit like the magician. He says, "Please convince yourself this is a perfectly ordinary hack." There's a sense in which it's not clear what the question is. It's like, well, I guess so. <laughs> um, if it's clear what the problem might be, you know, um, because my eyesight might be good, not be good, or it's too far away. We're not going to get a Cartesian problem there. So the example has to be structured in very particular ways. I have more to say about this. And John Austin, in the article Other Minds of the Reading, has a lot to say about how he thinks knowledge claims have to be structured. And there's a funny way in which Austin's article is sort of negatively helpful here. Everything Austin says about how the kinds of claims to knowledge he's interested in, when he's talking about goldfinches and so forth, none of that had better be true. <laughs> We're not going to get a Cartesian problematic. Um, um, so, uh, more about that later. Um, <coughs> now, uh, you know, correspondingly in these other areas of philosophy, you're going to have to have analogs for all these features. Of Cartesian skepticism. So, if we were talking about other minds, we talk about somebody flailing in pain, but they might be pretending. That's how you have to construct the Cartesian problem. Right? You don't say somebody trying to calculate the square root of 5,184 in their head, and whenever they do that, they pick their nose. That's not going to give you a very good example of skepticism about other minds. Um, so, again, it's got to be a kind of state that we don't seem to need to know a lot about the person to be able to tell they're in it. We're not experts with respect to telling people are in pain. You have to be a certain kind of expert to tell people are trying to, you know, um, you know, smuggle agricultural goods across the U.S. border. You know, there are certain people who are very good at saying, would you please open your bag? Aha, uh -huh, apples. Um, you don't need that skill. <laughs> That's not what's at issue here. It's got to be something like telling someone's in pain um, and so forth for all of the features. They've got to be right up close in good lighting. It's not hearing a noise and going, you know, I think someone on the first floor is being tortured. That's not going to get us Cartesian skepticism out of minds. Um, so you have to structure it analogously this way. How the, the structural analogies to best case work as you go across... Um, different kinds of Cartesian skepticism can itself be an interesting thing to explore. It's not trivial to see how this works. I think, you know, to take the maybe the hardest case where the structural analog involves us really seeing in abstract terms how these features work most clearly, I think would be to think about the aesthetics case. If you want to get aesthetic worries going about whether something is a work of art, you need to choose a very certain kind of case. You don't, um, and what that case itself is there, and this is why I choose this one. For other minds, the example Mill chose works fine now. The example Descartes chose works fine now. In the case of aesthetics, the example is historically conditioned. You've had people worrying for some time now about whether something's a work of art. But Tolstoy's example, and Roger Fly's example, and Clement Greenberg's example, and Arthur. Danto's examples are quite different. You know, it's a kind of object that some people think is art, but other people are scandalized by the idea that that could be art. And that example has historical conditions to it. It's not 
available the way um, sitting in front of um, the fireplaces. So um, how the Cartesian best case for generating the skeptical worry looks, if we take other skeptical cases, can be a little complicated. But there are structural features to what goes into it being a generic object. Um, what's an aesthetically a generic object as opposed to what's epistemologically a generic object does bear thinking about. Second step in the Cartesian problematic. We raise a worry about this best case. We direct our attention at the generic object. It looks like an awfully good example of something we ought to be able to know through the senses, or know in terms of knowing somebody else's mind, or whatever the area of philosophy we're in. Know in terms of knowing the meaning. John time that way. Um, whatever. Um, then we raise a doubt about it. And as we've seen, this doubt has to have a very particular structure for it to be Cartesian skepticism. The doubt always involves something that has the structure of an argument from illusion. You build up a case that is with respect to the inside position, the near side of the gap position, indistinguishable from the case we have now. So if it's philosophy of perception, it's sensuously indistinguishable. If it's other mind skepticism, his bodily state is bodily indistinguishable. His behavior, his behavioral manifestations are behaviorally indistinguishable from his actually being in pain. And then you say about that, how do you know in this case? But the very construction of that kind of doubt, using an argument from illusion, involves further structure. It, involves a dis it always involves an implicit distinction not always implicit, but at least implicit distinction between that which is dubitable and that which is invulnerable to doubt. So, when you're generating skepticism on other minds, that I can see how he's outwardly behaving. That it's pain behavior. That's not in question. The question is, how do I know behind the pain behavior there's really pain? That this seems to me a case of being in front of a classroom, being in front of a fireplace. That's not in question. But how do I know it's really a classroom? So there's always a distinction between that which is vulnerable and that which is invulnerable to doubt. It's, and we need a general word for this that covers very different kinds of philosophical cases. And I don't think there is a good word for this. Um, because I, I, people don't tend to try to give this general story about Cartesian philosophy in my sense of Cartesian. But let me introduce a word um, which some people have used. Bertrand Russell used this word in a very broad way. I'm taking Russell to be a kind of Cartesian. I think it's a helpful word. Um, um, so part of Cartesian doubt is something that always involves, in a sense, a paradigm of what knowledge is, a paradigm so it's invulnerable to doubt. There are things that we are acquainted with. And then the structure of the doubt is always one in which one says, the field of acquaintance could be exactly as it is now. But the world beyond what we are immediately acquainted with could be different. So what's being placed within the purview of acquaintance in the case of philosophy of perception is how things seem to me. Dreaming, seeing, those are different kinds of cases of acquaintance. But then, am I really in the classroom? That goes beyond acquaintance. And then the doubt is about that which goes beyond acquaintance. In the case of other minds, what I'm allowed to be acquainted with is his behavior. How things are with him, that goes beyond the realm of acquaintance. Similarly with testimony, similarly with the past, if you construct a Cartesian view about that, then you're, 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 you're structuring the field of acquaintance as one in which you're saying, well, what is going on now I'm acquainted with? The past goes beyond, and then you, you've generated the problem by structuring the gap at that point. Where, so there's always a field of acquaintance that is underlying the structure of the doubt, the side which is invulnerable to doubt. And so there's a certain kind of construction of that which is beyond acquaintance, that which you can be acquainted with. Things could be just as they are now with respect to what you're acquainted with, but 
you don't know. And then you have to respond. Um, there's a lot I could say about that, but I think I won't know. We want to get our different examples. Um, so, uh, next point. Once you have um, such a doubt, If you don't answer it, if you can't, you know, get it to work out that God is not a deceiver, so things must be as they seem to you in acquaintance, or you have some strategy for stopping things at this point. Even though you started with a particular example of the best case and generated this doubt directed at it, based on the fact that the claim to knowledge goes beyond the field of acquaintance. Then it is going to generalize. That's a, you know, this is a way of, as it were, testing whether you've picked the right kind of example. If the doubt goes through about this example, then the conclusion isn't, you know, I guess Professor Conant doesn't know anything about rifles. But you're not going to be able to conclude, I guess Professor Conant doesn't know anything about when he's in a classroom. Um, then you conclude, Oh my God! If we don't, he doesn't know that. If you want to say that is the I here is now representative of any inquiring person. <laughs> if you can perform it yourself, if he can't know that, then there we can't know things based on our senses. Um, so if you've got, if you, and this is why these features, as I said, are systematically related. Um, these are all aspects of the same philosophical problematic. If you pick this kind of example, and you've directed the right kind of doubt at it, and the doubt can't be withstood, then it will generalize. This particular case turns out to be representative of a whole class of epistemic cases, a class of things you can know by the senses, things you can know by interpreting them, um, things you can know in virtue of people telling you to, whatever the category um, of knowledge we're investigating. So, to put it a little more precisely, I put it more precisely so the contrast with Kantian skepticism can be clear in a moment. Um, we start with a conclusion about a particular candidate item of knowledge, but at this point in the recital, in this third step, if the doubt goes through, we move to a conclusion, a general conclusion about all such items. So we start with an investigation of the particular, so we have a, a conclusion of generality suddenly at this point. Investigation starts apparently with a certain kind of particularity, with the example, with the doubt. But at this point, suddenly, we have the generality, of, you know, a form of philosophical skepticism. Um, once you have that, you also have, you know, a genuinely philosophical puzzlement. You have the sense at this point that you've made a philosophical discovery. You know, if you find out, you know, you can't trust Professor Conant about rifles, or even you can't trust Pre President Bush about weapons of mass destruction, that might be sort of disturbing. But life can go on. You know, in the case of President Bush, it might be hard for Americans, but it goes on. You can still talk about a lot of things. But if this philosophical generalization goes through, it's not quite the same. It looks like you've made a fundamental discovery. Um, there's, now, there's different ways to put the discovery. Um, but it looks like something we always thought to be true, pre-reflectively, pre-philosophically, something that it sort of looks like has to be true. Namely, that I can know things about the world. Or that I can know how people are feeling. Or that I can know something about the past. Or take any of these cases. A kind of knowledge that looks <coughs> like you sort of would have thought we have to have. And certainly Grandma always thought you had it. Um, it suddenly looks like you no longer have an intellectually respectable basis for claiming you have. I want to make it clear. It's not that we <coughs> now know there is no past, or that we now know there is no external world. That's not the structure of Cartesian skepticism. The structure of Cartesian skepticism is that we're not in a position to know 
any specific candidate item about the external world. Okay. It's a it's a challenge to our knowledge. Oh, that is, it suspends our claim to knowledge. It doesn't offer a competing claim to know that there can't be such things. That would be, if you will, an alternative form of dogmatism. It's claiming to be skepticism. Uh, um, so, um, so we have this discovery. Um, and the discovery has a kind of character of seeing through our ordinary practices. Um, and many responses, it's worth pointing out here, that many responses to Cartesian skepticism keep, you know, they try to respond, they, they're so impressed by, as it were, the first three steps of the Cartesian recital that they often try to respond at this point. That is, they try to keep the discovery, there's some sense of discovery that the Cartesians got, saying, yeah, you've discovered something. But it's not that we don't know anything. That's very often the character, especially to what we might call anti-realist responses, the Cartesian skepticism. So Barclay says, it's not true that we don't know the tables and shapes, but it is true that there are no outer objects. Um, now Barclay, you know, will actually claim, um, but this is a hard line. Um, that's what the common sense person claims. So he'll claim this isn't a sort of scene, you know, it's just an analysis, what the common sense person thinks. But, um, but so very often, you know, contemporary philosophy people say, it's not that we don't have any knowledge by testimony. We, we can't have knowledge by testimony. But what it actually is, is perceptual basis plus inferential basis conjoined the special way. <laughs> so the idea that this was a distinctive kind of knowledge actually does go down the drain. A certain discovery the Cartesian skeptic thought he made here is being allowed. Or another kind of, you know, answer to the skeptic about the past is say, well, it's, we have knowledge of the past, but what knowledge of the past is are beliefs that are highly probable. And you say, well, that I was in this classroom three seconds ago? Well, that's, that's very, very, very probable. You know, that's 99.99% probable. But, you know, well, at this point, the, current, the fact, the, the skeptic about memories, sense that he made a discovery, hasn't completely been overturned. You might have thought, we just know some things about the past. No, we don't. He, that's being conceded. So often, responses to Cartesian skeptics start by trying to ward off his conclusion while seeding his sense of discovery. So, you know, an issue in and looking at response to Cartesian skepticism is this sense of a fundamental discovery that something we pre-philosophically thought was possible. Does it go through? Something's been overturned? But we withhold the skeptical conclusion? Or are we trying to resist at a point that keeps that discovery from going through? I think it's a fundamental distinction between how people respond to Cartesian skepticism. Um, a further feature of Cartesian skepticism, this is... Um, this is a rather vague feature. I have it for the different kinds of skepticism. We're only going to talk about two for the moment. Um, the, I, I distinguish, but I think it's sort of helpful. Um, but, um, it doesn't work very well by itself. Is it's worth thinking about sort of what the mood of the skepticism. Once you've got someone who's really worried about the skeptical problematic, what is the flavor of it? If you compare ancient skeptics to Cartesian skeptics, to people that are really worried about Kantian skeptical problematic, like Krippenstein, they actually do have quite a strikingly different, different mood. Um, ancient skeptics can be quite happy about their position. You know? It's going to give them tranquility. Um, it's, not what, it's not what later skeptics think. So, um, Cartesian skepticism in particular, I think, tends to be characterized by a mood of disappointment. There's something we thought we could have. Truth. Knowledge. Looks kind of basic. And if we let the skeptic win, some people think we should, some people think we should, but if we let the skeptic win, it turns out we can't have that. You know? We just, you know, we just, um, you know, I think Richard Rorty is an interesting case here. This is, you know, one of the ways in which I think one can see that Rorty is a kind of Cartesian skeptic whatever he says, is that his mood is that of disappointment. We once thought there was a God, 
but it turns out there's no God. We used to think there's truth. Turns out truth is just a compliment we pay our best beliefs. It turns out, well, some people who, who read Rorty sometimes read it in a sort of very Promethean vein. We're nothing but interpretation all the way down. <laughs> but if you ever heard Rorty lecture, you'll realize that actually the tonality of it is we're nothing but interpretation all the way down. Uh, any questions? Um, uh, and the reason you have a mood of disappointment is you have a particular structure in Cartesian skepticism. That is, there's something you can want, and it's part of the structure of Cartesian skepticism that we can form a clear conception of what it is that we want. We, the idea in Cartesian skepticism is we know what knowledge of the external world would be. But it turns out, if we think carefully about our position with respect to external things, we can't have it. So there's a conception. So the, the issue is always one of, as I put it before, reality or actuality. That there could be outer things. That's not the issue. The question is, how do I know I'm in bed rather than in front of the classroom? How can I know that? And, and Descartes, this is very vivid. I mean, Descartes has an idea of something like God's position. From God's position, we can see whether our inner experiences match how things are. <coughs> the problem is we don't have that position. So as we think clearly about our epistemic position, we realize it falls short of what we need in order to tell whether the actual case comports with the case we're in. So the word, with the idea of actuality and the doubt being directed at whether the actual, the real case is of the sort we want, goes to the idea that we can frame a conception of what it would be for things to be actually that way. What we can't do is adjudicate whether our position is one that matches our conception of what we would like things to be. So there isn't any probability problem about the intelligibility of knowledge of the external. It's taken to be a coherent idea. The problem is whether we have it. Whether our experiences are veridical. Um, that's why there's going to be a mood of disappointment. Because it looks like there's something we want, which we thought we had, which we can't have. There's a gap, and there's another side to the gap. And we can't get there. That generates, you know, Classically, even with little children, a structure of frustration and disappointment. It's right there. You know what it is. You can see you want it, but you can't have it. You, you can't see that you can have it. Michel? Yeah, just an answer to uh, I think you're right, absolutely right. Uh, but this gap is also kind of um, creating, let's say, tensions. It's creating interest, you know. If a small child, for example, can something have, it, it, it gets interesting. And everything you can have easily is very... Um, very um, uninteresting after a short time, so the gap also has its uh, good, uh, good sense. Uh, but Descartes is very clear. I mean, this is very basic. I mean, the, the disappointment is coming and kicking in a very clear early place here. I mean, Descartes is very clear. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's come to my last feature, and I'll say something about that, okay? Let's do it. But I think when we come to the ninth feature, we'll see something about that, the peculiarity of this case, which makes my analogy with a small child a little problematic. Um, so I was already starting to explicate the sixth feature and spelling out why the fifth feature is what it is, the mood of disappointment, which is that the kind of knowledge, the kind of achievement that the skeptic is directing his doubt at, there's no doubt about the cogency of its possibility. That is always assumed. And this is a huge difference from Kantian skepticism. You might say that's the point where the Kantian skeptical doubt <coughs> starts. Um, um, <coughs> but the question is, are things actually as they might possibly be? Um, come back to that in a moment, too. Um, oh, I can't believe what time it is. Okay, I'm going to go fast. So, there's a further feature of Cartesian skepticism is that it always has the form of an apparent impotence or inability. It always looks like 
a limitation of cognitive power. And again, many people, I think, nowadays take this to be constitutive of skepticism. But I think it's really always constitutive of Cartesian skepticism. Cartesian skepticism always looks like our cognitive powers don't reach far enough. We can only be acquainted with this much, and there's something we cannot do. We cannot know that. And so there's always, in a sense, the imposition of a limit. We run up against a limit. And then it turns out that limit kicks in an earlier place than we thought. We thought, you know, pre-reflectively something like, we can know or be acquainted with other people feeling. And then we think carefully and we go, no, we can see what they're behaving. We can draw inferences on this. But all we ever know is less than what they're feeling. And then it looks like there's no way to actually transverse that limit. So there's always a sense of something you cannot do, an impotence. Um, and with that, you can see how each of these features is really only statable by already presupposing the next one. Goes the idea of two sides to the limit. There's a near side and a far side. And that, you know, as it were, limit then the space between, I've sort of um, pictorialized with this image of the gap that has to be traversed. It looks like there's this space in between which we can't get across. And then as I pointed out, when we're talking about Cartesian skepticism, what the near side and the far side of the gap is can flip around, depending on which kind of Cartesian skepticism it is, but it will always have that structure. <coughs> Finally, and this is now connects with Mihail's last question, part of what makes the form, this is, one of the things this, this list of features is meant to do is distinguish Cartesian skepticism from other forms of skepticism. But another thing it's meant to do is make sure you've got a form of philosophical skepticism, and not just some fundamental non-philosophical doubt, like, can you trust the American government? Which I take it's not a form of skepticism. It's a damn good question. Um, <laughs> um, so one of the things that Descartes points out about skepticism about, um, about um, perception, but I take it um, has much further breadth, um, is that there's kind of practical instability. Descartes just wants to be clear. This is a heuristic doubt. You know? When you leave the study, don't start doubting your senses as you walk down the stairs. And definitely not by the time you get on your bicycle, let alone, you know, start up your car. You know? <laughs> this is not, you know, a prescription, you know, for a cognitive attitude to take towards the world. Um, and there's even some suggestion, other skeptics, famously Hume, that there isn't anything which would actually be translating the skeptical attitude into a practical attitude. Um, so there's, um, that's putting it very strongly. But it, I think putting it slightly less strongly, there's at least a practical instability to the Cartesian problematic always. It's at least always unclear what it would be to affirm the skeptical conclusion and then to try to, as it were, actually practically organize one's practical commitments in the light of acquiescing to it. That's at least always unclear. I want to put it that way because in certain areas of Cartesian skepticism, like testimony, one case, and I think even clear cases, aesthetics, like art, I think, you know, it's not as obvious that you can't actually take up a skeptical attitude and say, you know, um, you know, the skeptic is right. But it's still, if you actually thought about what it would be like to have your practical attitudes all organized by that commitment. Usually those sorts of skeptics will still say, well, for practical purposes, of course, we always say blah, blah, blah. But what we, we're speaking with the vulgar and what we really mean is it's very hard to see what it would be to actually have one's practical commitments change. Um, now, quickly, Kantian skepticism. What happens here with these features is that none of them are the same. But I think you'll also notice that none of them are completely unrelated to the previous ones. That is, there's a kind of displacement of the Cartesian feature, a kind of transformation of it, as the problematic takes on this shape. And I think, actually, if we looked at the transition from ancient skepticism to Cartesian skepticism, if we looked at certain other intermediate cases of two forms of skepticism, we'd find the same thing. As we try to lay out the features, there are, um, there's a structural homology, which isn't the same thing as there being an identity. <coughs> so, in the first instance, one 
important feature about Kantian skepticism is once you've gotten through to a Kantian level, this is kind of a negative feature, but it's worth making explicit in contrast to the Cartesian one. It doesn't matter what your example is. And that's remarkable <laughs> feature of a kind of inquiry. That is, as I put it here, there's a peculiar sort of indifference to the character of the object. If I'm worried about Kantian skepticism about perception, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm equal, I, I'm, if I'm worried about how can a perceptual field so much as present me with an appearance that purports to be thus and so, then that's a skeptical problem that touches my being in front of the classroom or my dreaming I'm in front of the classroom. That's equally problematic, the true and the false. The epistemically ideal, am I standing here right now? Or how I could think I saw a bird at 30 feet, the epistemically non-ideal. All of the distinctions that matter that we saw had to be carefully tailored to construct the generic object versus around conditions of expertise and non-expertise, the first person being able to stand in and be representative, a lot of ideality and non-ideality, optimality and non-optimality of conditions, specificity versus generic character of the object. It's being a belief that's a candidate for truth as opposed to something I believe is false. None of that matters. Once you break through to a Kantian skeptical problematic, all of the dimensions under long, along which you have to distinguish, and there's an, a whole bunch of dimensions I've just mentioned, to whom your Cartesian example, so it generates Cartesian skepticism, on either side of each of those dimensions, pick one, generic versus specific, optimal versus non-optimal, true versus false, you lose both sides if the Cartesian skeptical, the Kantian skeptical problematic goes through. So what this means is the point I made earlier today when I was saying why you might not think this is a kind of skepticism. What you have, if you're clear about your Kantian skepticism, I think people often aren't. This will come up when we look at Kripke again. Kripke, people think Kripke's a meaning skeptic, or Kripkenstein's a meaning skeptic. They think skepticism is supposed to be a doubt. So they try to formulate the issue there in terms of a doubt about something. That only misses what the real problem is. Um, you, it's, it starts turning it back into a Cartesian problem. How do I know if he's adding or quadding? Well, there is a philosophical problem you can structure that. So that's a Cartesian problem. That's not Kripke's problem. Um, we're clear about it. I don't think Kripke's completely clear about it. We could say this: it's not Wittgenstein <laughs> um, at that point in the investigations. Um, if you're clear about what your Kantian problematic is, you're not possessed by a doubt anymore. A word, I, I, an English word, which I've discovered by having my um, work on this translated to other languages, is very hard to translate other languages, uh, including French and German. Um, and if you're interested, Icelandic um, is the word bottle. The Kantian skeptical, the Kantian skeptic, with respect to his target, problematic, is not in a relation of doubt. He's in a relation of boggling. How is it so much as possible that? Wondering. Uh, well, wondering is um, its a very specific kind of wondering. I can wonder about something without being in any doubt that the question has an answer. Um, but here, the bottle tends to swallow the very capacity to engage in this sort of wonder. Um, I am right now having an experience of being in a classroom. But how is that so much as possible? But, I, but, I, but it's very hard for me to take the attitude of, maybe I can't have such experiences. I wonder if I can have them. That's not a real option. You can't sort of suspend you know, um, commitment to the idea that we have determinate contents. And one sees this most clearly, as I was saying last time, if you take the language case. You know, the very formulation of the boggle commits you to the idea that the question you're asking, the wonder you're formulating, at least that has a determinate content. <laughs> so, so, so Bagel was meant, um, I, you know, I think a helpful Kantian word, as I was suggesting when I was studying here, is schematization. There's a, it has the form of a, of a sense of 
wonder that one can so much as schematize the phenomena in question. And the act of formulating that attitude of boggling itself involves schematization. <laughs> you know, when we're worrying about the schematism in Kai, we are schematizing. Why don't we do it? There isn't anything which is stepping back. This is why it's not like the Cartesian problematic, which always divides to an area of invulnerability on this side of what we're acquainted with. There we feel safe. Cartesian skepticism always has this feeling. But once we go beyond that, we're venturing into the realm of the epistemically risky. What, he's, what his body's like, that's safe. What's going on inside, that's a risky claim. How things seem to me, that's safe. How things are in the world, that looks risky. There's no ground of safety once you've got the Kantian problem. There's no place to retreat to. The place you're trying to prosecute the inquiry from is itself starting to collapse under your feet as you're doing it. Hence, I say, Bible. I'm going to not take your question because okay. I'm already late. I want to just go through this, this real fast. So I'm just going to so just say these so you have a sense of how they contrast with the Cartesian ones. Third feature, we don't start from a particular case. And then thinking it through, have the bottom drop out. So we have a general conclusion. In Kantian skepticism, say it's philosophy of perception. The worry is, how can you so much as have an experience of a particular? Hume says, we have impressions of this, we have impressions of that. But how can we know blah, blah, blah? The Kantian problem becomes, how can you so much as have a forstellung of something? So the, the particulars from which we start themselves are impugned. Um, Fourth feature. That means you don't have a sense of a discovery. The discovery presupposes the next feature of there being something intelligible that's being doubted. You have a sense of mystery that a certain kind of phenomenon <coughs> doesn't now seem to be possible. Um, and so this is why Kantian answers always have the form of how can we give us description of the world in which these sorts of things, meanings, experiences of the world or whatever no longer seem mysterious. I think that's part of the reason naturalism is increasingly the dominant form of philosophical explanation because the questions are dominantly Kantian and naturalism holds out at least the appearance of giving an answer in which no mysterious entities are postulated because what we're trying to do is make a phenomenon seem unmysterious. The mood isn't one of disappointment. You can only be disappointed if you know what you want, but you can't have it. The mood, Kant says already, in the prolegomena of skepticism, when he's talking about his kind of skepticism, is despair. Because the very kind of capacities we're drawing on and asking our question draw the possibility of being able to do that itself into question. So our mood is one of despair, I say. Um, I think we better stop. I haven't gone through the gift, the list, but if you go, I, I think you should be able to just be able to keep going using the list itself, using the Cartesian features, seeing how they displace. Okay, so what we're going to do next time, I'm sorry I'm falling behind, is we're going to look at a passage from H.H. H. Price and see how it I quote the two passages in my article. I might just read those two quotations. We'll start with them. My claim is they have a lot of words in common. They're both on a books on perception, on chapters on perception. They're both in chapters called The Given, which are at the beginning of such books. Reading them quickly, you might say they're about the same thing. My claim is that Price has a Cartesian problematic. Lewis has a Kantian problematic. And then what we're mostly going to do next time is try to get clear what Lewis's problematic is. What is it really to be a Kantian about perception? How does that change the problem? from the Cartesian problem. Because I think Lewis's agenda in philosophy of perception is really the one that we have now. Lewis is one of the people who made that urge. It doesn't mean he's now famous, but that's part of when the change really started to happen, thinking about perception. So that's what we're going to do next time. So please read especially chapter two of the Lewis carefully.